Welcome to A Place of Hope in Forney, Texas, where you will find hope-filled, obedient, passionate, and engaging people. Now on to today's message with Dr. Kevin Wentworth. Well, good evening. We welcome you to A Place of Hope. Sounds like a broken record every week when we get together, but I want to make sure it gets implanted in our mind that we are a place of hope and we are bringing hope to people as they get a chance to listen. I get every so often a little note from some folks that saying we enjoyed your message last week, so I'll, I'll take those kinds of uh, messages for sure. And we always know what our plan is and our mission. Our mission is to be hope-filled, obedient, passionate, engaging followers of Christ. And again, when we think of Christmas, we know that he brought hope into the world, and we know that Jesus was obedient, and we know that everywhere he walked, he was passionate. And the main thing that we watched in his life, and I've said it before, there's no question when you read the Gospels, he engaged people. And that's what our call is to be hope-filled and obedient and passionate, to be followers and engaging with Christ. And so we, have, we always have our vision statement, which is that we are a place of hope for a hurting world. We want people to know that uh, they can come here and uh, be accepted no matter who they are, where they've been or what they've done, realizing that God has a message and a plan for their lives and there's a reason why we're here. And we appreciate all the folks that... Uh, are here tonight and some that are out with their family and we have uh, I got a, a text from uh, uh, Bill about uh, or Diane Tom and Diane Leigenauer who come who come come occasionally their kids go to Richardson and uh, he had to go back in the ER last night so we've been praying for Tom who's had a lot of struggles these past year but uh, went to visit him this week and uh, had a chance to just pray with him and and you know that's kind of what I enjoy about being a pastor is just going with people and praying with them and having an opportunity to be there in their times. I wish I could take away the pain and the hurts that go in their lives. But I, I think when I walk in, it just at least gives them hope that someone cares. And that's what we all should do. It isn't just a pastor's job. That's the way all of us should be. So we're going to sing some familiar songs tonight. And uh, I think we're going to have probably Vernon strike up his vocal cords with us tonight along with everybody else. So join us, if you will. Away, oh, a manger, no crib for a man. A little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky look down where he lay. The to stay close by me forever and to bless all the dear children but the main thing I like about why he's come and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight fit us prepare us 
We want to make a decision for heaven to live with thee there. Let's sing that again. Be near, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care.
that was to fall and come and just fall on our knees to hear the angel voices. A night, a night that was divine. A night when our Christ was born. Oh night, what a holy night that was. Father, I think tonight in our world, our world needs to take note of this song. Fall on your knees. The angel.
angels are singing. But are we listening? So I pray that you'll help us to experience this Christmas in a way, Father, that maybe will be new and fresh. And it may cause us to just fall on our knees with thanksgiving. For we ask it in thy name and all God's people said. You may be seated. Listen to this verse. We didn't sing it, but let's listen to this. Led by the light. Of faith the ringly beaming with glowing hearts by his cradle we stand. So led by light of a star sweetly gleaming, here come three wise men. From oriented land, the King of Kings lies thus in lowly manger in all our trials, born to be our friend. I like this. This is why I wanted to sing it. He knows our need. is no stranger. Behold your King before Him gladly bend. got burning so choked up he was singing so good with us all right hearing all the parts well tonight tonight we're going to uh share with you the last part of my christmas experiencing the, the miracle we talked about the miracle, the message, the miracle, the method, the miracle, the miracle of the, uh, the uh, moment, and recognizing that moment. Remember, we got to Galatians chapter 4, where it says, at the right time, God sent his son. And we talked about the method and how he did it, and we talked about the message of what that is for us as we come to this time. So, tonight I finish it out with the miracle of the mess, the manger. I like that. Experience the miracle, and the next slide is the miracle of the manger. And it's, you know, again, uh, Norita will find this out as she continues to pastor. After 48 years, what more can you say when you come to Christmas? But it's interesting how God does provide some awesome messages no matter how long you preach because really his story is not just one to be done in a year or two or even 10. His story is covers it all, amen? It's a story that has implications for all of us and there's something new to learn from it and I think that's why it's very important for us. Everybody hear me okay through the speaker? Okay, just checking. So tonight... What we're going to do is take you through a little journey and talk about the miracle of the manger. And let's to turn together, you'll kind of see it on the screen, but John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. In the beginning, it's familiar scripture, 
in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone, not just to some, but to everybody. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never, I like that way, I like the way this New Living Translation, it may be that way in your translation, but I like the way it said it here. Darkness can never extinguish it. Amen. His light can always shine, and it makes a difference. Okay, let's go on. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. All right? But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human. I like some of the other versions. The word became flesh, but I like this one too. So the word became flesh, and other versions say he moved into the neighborhood. I just love that. I just like that version. Moved into the neighborhood, but we have to say what the scripture says up here. He made his home among us. And I even like that translation because what he's doing, he's coming in, and he's going to live among us and help us to understand who he is and see more and more because he came right into where we, he didn't come to sit somewhere else. He came in our home right among us to understand what we were, we were like and what the Father was going to show us through him. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. Amen. Isn't that great to know that the, the Lord has come and the miracle of the manger, the experience of the manger so, so what I want to share with you tonight, first of all, is who exactly is this child that we find in the manger in Bethlehem? That's why we sang those two songs. So if you go to the next slide, the one thing that we see is an astonishing claim, and an astonishing claim, and it's found in Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Here's where it says, the Savior, yes, the Messiah. <laughs> Look at the way the Living Translation the Savior, yes, the Messiah. The Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Kind of making a, a very exclamated sentence right there. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for. Now, the thing that's interesting about this, when you think about the astonishing claim, could he be who he claims to be? That's kind of where I want to take you on tonight on this journey. Consider for a moment the manger scene that all of us in this room have been a part of. Uh, how many of you, when you were a kid, played shepherds and some were wise men? And they never picked me for the wise man part. I'm not sure why, but, but uh, they, never, they never seemed to pick up on the, that I was a wise person. But, uh, but sometimes we had Mary and Joseph, and we always tried to find a mom and a, a mother that was, had just had a baby so it would look a little authentic. But we, we see this astonishing story, and when we see this astonishing story, we realize the, the claim made about this child. Into the humblest of circumstances, Jesus is born. An ordinary mother, ordinary person, birthplace in a stable, born in a small, obscure town, not any flash, no no neon lights, uh, you know, a few, d few days from now, we've got the 4th of July, well, on, or 4th of July, yeah, I can get my holidays messed up, New Year's, because in our neighborhood, the 4th of July and New Year's are fireworks constantly, so I get them all mixed up. But at the end of our block, end of our road, there's a lot of fireworks stands, and about 10 days before the fireworks, they start opening up. Well, the interesting thing is, is, they, you, you ever, you, those of us old timers that I would be speaking to, some of you that might listen in may not know this, but years ago, you remember, especially I did in Detroit, is they used to have these big skylights that would send a beam up into the clouds and go back and around and try to, and you, sometimes you try to follow where the thing was coming from. Well, they do that at the end of my, my road. They've got these big 
thing that shines up and it moves around, kind of catches everybody's attention. Into the, so, so here we see none of that was there. They didn't, I guess they didn't want to have skylight then back in Bethlehem. But yet Jesus made some astonishing claims for us of his identity. He claimed throughout his ministry that he was God's, the son of God, even one with God. We see the announcement here, he's the Messiah. He claimed to be the bread of heaven. He claimed to be the living water. He claimed that he alone can satisfy. He claimed and talked about our satisfying our deepest hungers. I'm trying to help you see what he claimed. He promised grace and mercy free. He claimed the authority to forgive our sins. Think of all this stuff. From this one little baby, all the things that he claimed. That Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection. The only hope of escaping God's judgment. The only path to eternal life. Jesus claimed all authority in heaven and earth. He promised to return to judge the world. So when you think about all those claims, they're pretty radical. Pretty, you know, that's why I think the world sometimes struggles, and we've gotten away from it a little bit, but I think we need to proclaim it even stronger. Jesus is who he said he was, and he claimed his claims are things that we can hold on to and believe, and we've seen, if, if I were to go through those things again, if I went by them slowly, would you and I not understand that there have been times when he has been all of those in your life? He satisfied your hunger. He's provided grace and mercy. He's the way, the truth, in the life. He's the resurrection. He claimed to be, we know they talked about eternal life. He's the bread of heaven. He's the one. So what I'm trying to say is, he, we have all had the opportunity, if we know him as our Savior, even though we may not recognize it sometimes, he has been everything he claimed he would be. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm so glad he claimed and he claims, he claims, and he claims, and I have been recipient of those claims. There are so many, really, that we can't really ignore them at all. There are those who respectfully, there's a statement made this morning, as I told you, I listened to Laren's sermon uh, before I come because he's an hour ahead of us. My son's pastoring up in Michigan, so his service is an hour before mine. If I like his sermon, better than mine, I try to use his when I get to the church, because, you know, I can, I'm not plagiarizing, I'm just saying, this is what I heard, you know, this is what I heard from a astute pastor that I know real well, but this morning he made an, he had an interesting testimony that intrigued me a little bit, Marty, and, and I think you'll know where I'm coming from when I make this statement, there was this young lady on, and I, I, I'm not trying to downgrade her testimony, had a great testimony about how his church had impacted her life. So I, I'm not downgrading. But here's an interesting comment. That I don't know what, it's one of those things when you're listening, it just kind of just kind of hits you and just sticks with you for a minute, for a little bit. And so all day this has been sticking with me. And the lady said this phrase, God was with us all my life. God has been a part of our family all our life. Now, I know we can interpret that different. But what was interesting, it was kind of this we knew about God all our, we've known about God, we've, we've had God all our life, but there was no relationship. And it concerned me when she made that comment. Again, again, I, I'm not criticizing her, but what was interesting is there's a lot of people that think they have God, and that's enough. I know God. Our family raised in the church, so we've had God with us you know, and I know God's been with us. And, and you know, I, wa- I don't want to belabor that too long, but I want to make sure we understand God is more than just being with us. He wants to live in us, work through us, and bring us a life that's beyond imagination. He just doesn't want to be with us, and we don't need to be just claiming. You know, it's, it's almost like someone saying, well, I've been a good person. I, those phrases just kill me. I've been a good person. It isn't a good person that gets us to heaven. It isn't having God in, in, our, in our life and because they recognize God in their lives. It's not just recognizing God. In our, it's a God who's transforming my life and working. And that's what I want to kind of get out with that testimony. I, just, I, I think a lot of people that go to church sometimes and a lot of people make a lot of claims and 
they, they know that God's been with it. Well, God's been with us all because God is with everybody he's created. The problem is rather we recognize it and rather, and the point of the matter is, is, is we need to know that God created everybody, right? If he created everybody, he wants everybody to be with him. But it is, he wants us more than just being with us. He wants to be in us. He wants to move among us. He wants to transform us. He wants to bring life to us. He wants to bring life more abundantly to us. He just doesn't want us to know him. We want to live him. <laughs> Amen? And that's the power of the manger. The religion of Islam teaches that Jesus was a prophet. You, some of you that are smarter than I know that. The Hindu religion teaches that Jesus is one way, many to God. Many people want to admire Jesus from a distance, and that's what I kind of sensed this morning. But when it comes right down to it, He's, he, you know, some people think he's just a nice man with a beard. Well, C.S. Lewis said this. Explain this to us. Jesus did not leave us the option of just respecting him as a good, noble teacher. His own claims leave no room for that position, even though it is very popular. C.S. Lewis goes on to say, we only have three options concerning what to make of these astonishing claims of Jesus. Either he was who he claimed to be, the Lord of all, or he made these claims knowing they were false and therefore he's a liar, or third, he made these claims because he believed them to be true, but in reality they were not, which makes him deceptive and a lunatic. So when it comes to the astonishing claims made by Jesus are three conclusions. You know what they are? He is either Lord, a liar, or a lunatic. You've used that before? That's an important thing. He cannot be just a nice man with a beard. But the next thing we see, the staggering implications of that. What if he is who he claims to be? That's one of the interesting things. Staggering implications is, what if he is who he claims to be? Now, some of you have watched The Miracle on 34th Street. I, I believe that's the name of it. Part of the drama of the movie is the increasing evidence perhaps this Chris Crinkle really is Santa Claus. Every character in the story must decide for themselves what they believe about Chris Crinkle. Some want the old man declared insane and put away. But many others are ready to support him as Santa Claus. So the question comes to us, do you believe what about this child born in Bethlehem? What if his claims are true? The incredible, staggering implications that has. What if there is that awesome, what if there is that awesome someone who knows your name, who knows when you are sleeping, and he knows when you're awake? <laughs> and I have a little added line to that. He knows when you've been bad or good. <laughs> Amen. And he loves you and longs for you to know him and love him. Quite an interesting scenario. What if this child in Bethlehem really is the miracle of a manger? What if Jesus really is who he claims to be? If he is, the interesting thing that we have to decide today, and it kind of goes along with the moment I preached about three weeks ago, we've got to decide what we believe. We've got to, you know, in this season, I think we as pastors should challenge our people once again. Is he who he says he is? And if he is, are we living what we believe he is in us? That's a good question for us. I think it's important for us to challenge one another, to recognize if these things are true, are we living it in our lives? And we've got to make, and, I, and I, I did this this morning at the church I was at this morning. I asked people, I said, you know, we've got this moment. There's a moment. God gives us all moments. Those of you that were here a few weeks ago, you remember when I, I, I had a silent moment for a minute, and you all thought either he was having a stroke or he was getting blessed. I didn't say a word for one minute. Think about that sometime, Norita, when you're up front preaching. Don't say anything for about a minute and let everybody 
They're all looking around, and one lady started shouting, what, what, what is it you want to say, some lady said this morning. I just sat there for a minute. I said, isn't it, isn't it interesting? One minute went by. A moment went by. When a moment goes by, how upset sometimes we get when it's so quiet. But we have to decide. If he is who he says he is, we've got to make a decision. And I think it's important for us, even challenging those that have been in the church all our lives. I, I'm, I'm just kind of pouring my heart out here tonight. Even though we can claim we've been to church all our lives, I still think that we need to challenge our folks. There's a decision you need to make. Are you going to go all the way? Are you going to go deeper? Are you determined that you're going to let him be what he needs to be in your life even today? Not what he was when you started, not when he was last year, but are we determined I've got to make a decision. If, he claim, if, we, if he, his claims are true and we believe his claims are true, We've got decisions to make in our life, even as church folks, even as people who claim to be Nazarene, holiness people, or whatever denomination we can throw in. We've got a decision to make. It is a matter of eternal significance for each of us of what we decide. I said it this morning. There's going to come a moment when we have to make a decision because in the moment, if any of us in the room, anybody here, anybody listening later on, there could be a moment in your life where you have no more moments. That'd be your last moment. The next moment will be where you end up in eternity. And I think that's a challenge for us in the church. I think that's a challenge for us because I believe that God is providing the way for the church today to be the light in the dark world. And it's the church that's got to stand up. And we need to stand up to be, we need to stand up and stand behind the claims that Jesus has claimed he is through us. And be what we need to be for him. Praise God. This little child, we have to decide about this child born in Bethlehem. It'll determine our eternal destiny. But the thing that's interesting I want to make sure that we emphasize at this season of the year, we shouldn't just be concerned about our eternal destiny. And I want to make sure I make myself clear. But I also want you to understand, we need to decide if he is who he claims to be. We need to decide it because it determines our earthly directions as well. How we're living now. That's important. We cannot, exclaim, we cannot accept his claims without recognizing that, that he has staked his claim in our lives and he is who he says he is. And we need to live as he says he does in us. His promises are true. He really can wipe away painful past. He can take away our burden of guilt. He can give us a whole new reason to live and fill us with the fullness of his life and his grace. And I'm telling you today, what he claims, what he claims is true, and we can stand on it today. What a staggering implication that has. But then we come to the last part, a fateful choice. In Matthew chapter 16, familiar for those of us who have been in church a while, but for those of you that may listen in and don't know about the church much, maybe haven't come across this, but when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Go back up one there. Good. So those of you that have been in church, you've probably heard sermons. Who do you say he is? But I think this Christmas, I think the church needs to really look at itself and say, who do we say he is? And if we believe in what he says he is, we need to be what he's called us to be. And we need to accept his acceptance of the claims for our lives for a dark world. And it, I like the phrase that said earlier on, Marty, where it says, the darkness cannot extinguish it. Praise God. 
We can blame Satan. We can blame culture. We can blame this. We can blame that. Well, the reason we're going down the way we're going and the way we're in this world is because of the things around. No, I got news for you. Jesus is not going to be extinguished. His light will not be extinguished, and the church needs to recognize that because if we're not careful, we are almost letting the world extinguish him in our churches by not living the way we need to. And so we need to ask ourselves the fateful choice. He put the question to these men, who do you say I am? So, as I think about it tonight, the miracle of the manger, the experience of the manger is God in the flesh. He is a judge of all. We do not determine his fate. Thank you for listening today. Determine our fate. Scripture records in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the tribunal of Christ so that each one may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. The miracle of the manger is that God became flesh, lived among us. He came not so he could send us to eternal punishment, but he came to set us free. And John writes, but to all who do receive him, he gave them the right to become children of God through those who believe in his name. We have a faithful choice to make. Now, seems like an easy thing. It seems like for us that have been in the church all our life, well, that, that's a nice, nice, little, nice little cozy message. I didn't plan it to be cozy. I planned on it to be very heart-searching for any of us, including the one who's bringing the message. Because I want this Christmas, I want the churches of our district and the churches here in Forney and in Tarot and and Midlothian, and all the churches and the ones that are visited, I want them to recognize that God has a moment right now for the church to be the church and needs to show its light to the world because the light of Jesus is not going to be extinguished. But what's going to happen is I believe the church can extinguish, follow this train a minute, can extinguish the power of the message if we don't live the way we're supposed to live. And the light can be lost. But I'm going to tell you what, it's not lost. It'll always be shining, and it needs to be shining among us for us to be what he needs us to be. Amen? So we've experienced the moment. We've experienced the message. We've experienced the method. And now, tonight, we've experienced the manger. Now, we're not going to have a service next Sunday. Uh, A lot of churches are not. Some are. Uh, but what I am going to do, I've already talked with uh, Jim, I'm going to tape a service this week for Christmas Eve, and whenever you get together with your family and you want them, I'm going to sing what uh, Mary Did You Know and a couple other little Christmas songs, and then I'll preach. There won't be anybody here to, to yell at here in the building, but uh, uh, I'll be, or preach at, but uh, I'm going to share a message for you for maybe if, if you want, it's not going to be a long message, but just maybe your folk family might want to. Give them, give them the opportunity to listen to it. Uh, the way we're doing it now is you can find me on YouTube, put my name, and it'll show you every service. Jim's been putting them out. We've been trying to deal with lighting. For those of you that are watching, our lighting is a little bit. And you need the lighting problem is because of our crazy world daylight savings time. It's dark in this building. I have no light. When it's summertime, and, the, and so I can tell you that the light will change in our services on the first Sunday of March when the time goes back. But until then, a little dark, but we're still working on it. But I thank you so much for your support. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you've meant to Pam and I. Thank you for staying with us. We're going to continue on letting God do what he needs to do in us. And I pray and trust that you have a great Christmas with your family and know that you're loved. Norita, would you dismiss us in prayer, please, tonight? Amen. 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 Marty, would you take up the offering, please, before everybody gets out of here? We don't want to go without getting their money, you know. I mean, that's Nazarene, good Nazarene after all. God bless you and have a great Christmas. 
at 413 South Bodark Street in Forney, Texas. If you'd like to learn more, email us at kwentworth at netxnaz.net. That's k-w-e-n-t-w-o-r-t-h at n-e-t-x-n-a-z dot net.